morning about uh, training in a low carb state where you uh, you train your, your fat system, your fat oxidation system and maximize and get that working and you're relying on that. And then for competition days, um, maybe adding some carbohydrates uh, for the actual event, either the night before or during the race or whatever. And a lot of people find that uh, advantageous. There are certainly uh, people on, uh, on low carb diets who say, yeah, but when I need to sprint, uh, you know, cycle up that hill or sprint finish or something, I don't quite have the, the burst that I think I should. And maybe that, those people need to, uh, to have some carbs uh, on board. So if I want to summarize, uh, it's clearly good for health. We know that. Um, it's good for ultra endurance athletes. It's a little bit unclear as to whether it's, uh, it's, it's good for more intense exercise. I think it's a very individual thing, but uh, it probably varies from, from individual to individual. So is it for everyone? Someone asked this morning, you know, is a ketogenic diet for everyone? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think it's necessary for everyone. Probably everyone is gonna be healthier on it, but I don't think it's necessary for everyone. Probably every person has an optimal level of carbohydrate intake. And that depends really on their degree of insulin resistance. So if you're se severely, significantly insulin resistant, if you're Tim Noakes and, uh, and your blood sugars are going up and you have all the indicators of, of insulin resistance, then yes, you know, a low carb, become ketogenic diet is certainly the diet for you. Um, I very strongly recommend that. If you're, and, and you know, many, many older people. So in young people, the majority are reasonably insulin sensitive. There are a group that are insulin resistant. In people of, of my age and, and middle age, you know, most of us are gradually becoming more and more uh, insulin resistant. Uh, but there are some who are still very insulin sensitive, who can eat whatever they like and remain skinny and healthy and so on. So, you know, it's probably not as important for the insulin sensitive people to be on a low carb diet, but, you know, because they seem to metabolize carbs very well. But the interesting thing is, and, and athletes are a classic example. What about years and years of high carbohydrate intake? You know, carb loading and, and Gatorades and Powerades and carbs and carbs and carbs and carbs for a you know, sporting career of 10, 20, 30 years. What effect is that going to have long term? You know, is the pancreas going to eventually say, oh, God, give us a break. You know, I'm exhausted. Sorry, I can't give you any more insulin. You know, so that may well be a factor. I think anecdotally, I think a lot of retired athletes develop type two diabetes, I don't know whether that's your experience as Peter and Steve and so on, but you know, we, we need to do some studies on that. But I suspect that may well be uh, may well be the reason. I'm getting the line up here. I've got to talk about politics. Just finish with uh, with politics. The politics of speaking over your time. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's, you know, it's very obvious to us, isn't it? That, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Low carb is, is the way to go. And yet that's what, you know, the medical profession is saying. So, you know, if the evidence, you know, to all of us is so obvious, I mean, that's what, you know, makes me, you know, a lie awake at night worrying about this. You know, it's so bloody obvious that, uh, you know, carbs are bad for us and we need to reduce them. How come everyone else can't see that? Well, you know, there are a number of reasons and there are a lot of, there are a number of impediments, okay? Unfortunately, the first impediment is the medical profession. I alluded to that earlier about their, their lack of nutrition knowledge, lack of understanding, the general conservatism. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful expression that says 50% uh, of everything we get taught in medical school is wrong. You just have to work out which 50%. You know, we're still struggling to work out that, uh, that one of it is, uh, is nutrition and so on. So we're very conservative. We're very reluctant to, uh, to change. We're very much in this drug and surgery paradigm, this disease model. You know, the model of we wait till people get sick and then we try and fix them rather than stopping them getting sick in the first place. We've got to replace the disease model with the health model. Uh, dietitians, well, with due respect to the dietitians here are obviously, you know, uh, enlightened. The dietitians are very negative about low carb. And look, in a way I can, I can understand it. If you've been preaching something for 30 years, and you know, some uh, clown of a doctor in South Africa gets up and says, you know, you're wrong. Um, you know, your natural reaction is gonna be to resist that. And uh, it takes a bit of courage uh, to admit that we have been wrong. And uh, I'm certainly happy to, but horrified the advice I've given to some patients uh, over the years. And uh, I apologize to all of them. But um, you know, you've got to admit sometimes that you're wrong and you've got to change, be prepared to change. And the dietitians need to do that. And they need to do it fast or they'll become totally irrelevant. The food industry obviously has a huge vested interest in, in maintaining the, the status quo. But as I said, you know, 
they, they adapted very well to low fat. You know, okay, they put sugar in, but they adapted. And I think they'll adapt very well to, to low carb. We're just going to convince them that's, uh, that's the way to go. The agriculture is particularly an issue in this country. I think that's uh, one of the reasons why the next one, the politicians, are so reluctant to, uh, to, take, uh, to take this on. But uh, Robin uh, stole my thunder a little bit. Uh, thanks, mate. Um, now, uh, <laughs> but because I think what's uh, what's happened is that uh, you know the public is confused to this um, because there's so many different terminologies and different diets. There's low carb, there's paleo, there's Mediterranean, there's Atkins, there's Ducan, there's low GI, etc., etc. There's another 50 different diets, and we're sending mixed messages out the whole time. And I agree with Roman that the public is confused. I think, uh, you know, they want to know is fat good or bad, you know, is dairy okay, and what about meat, can I eat fruit, what about fruit juice, what about whole grain, which yogurt is best, I mean, these are the questions that I get asked and people keep telling me, oh, I'm confused, I don't know what I should be eating. I mean, you know, for 30 years I felt quite comfortable. I've been bloody unhealthy, but I've been quite comfortable. <laughs> Why are you confusing me? Stop it! And, uh, you know, I think that's a major problem. And uh, so, I have a, I have a suggestion. Okay? The one thing that we all agree on, even the dietitians agree on, is sugar. Okay, everyone agrees that sugar is a major problem, sugar overload. Okay, so why maybe, why don't we just focus on sugar as the, the low hanging fruit? Excuse the front toes come, but uh, um, you know, why don't we, why don't all these, what I'm trying to do is, uh, and this is where we get our sugar from. You know, you're, all, you're familiar with you know, it's soft drinks and it's fruit yogurts and it's the breakfast cereals and it's biscuits and buns and pastries and so on and sugar, you know, you know all that sort of stuff. And good old Coke. I don't like to pick on Coke, but you know, it's bad. <laughs> um, so, at the moment, the average Australian, let's talk about teaspoons, because that's, you know, there's different currencies and so on. Let's just talk about teaspoons. The average Australian intake of added sugar, not, not natural sugars, but added sugars, 25 teaspoons a day, okay? You think, well, that's a lot. No, nah, it's only a bottle of Coke. Um, <laughs> um, the WHO, the upper limit recommended is 12, uh, which is 10% of, uh, of your overall calories. Their ideal limit is six, okay? So what I'm suggesting is, something that's called sugar by half, okay? So to reduce the daily intake of added sugar by 50%, say from 25 at the moment, to 12, that upper limit of the, I know my maths is not quite right, but uh, that upper limit of, uh, of the WHO recommendations. So not even getting down their ideal. In five years, okay? That would have a massive, that would have a massive impact on the health of my country and your countries. And how can we do that? Well, education, particularly children. I mean, you know, our generation, we're probably a lost cause, but uh, our kids are Nutrition guidelines, you know, I mean, come on. You know, how much more evidence do they need to change uh, the guidelines? Food labeling, you know, really, uh, really important. You know, we need to start uh, putting the amount of sugar. We need to put uh, a little teaspoon with the number of teaspoons of sugar, num a number in it, on every item of processed food. Because people don't understand about calories and grams and things like that. Everyone knows how much a teaspoon of sugar is. Health warnings, people say, ah, oh, waste of time, no one takes any notice of it. People do take notice of them, and they're a, they're a message. They're a sign that the government and others agree that something should be done. And taxation's another one. Now, I do my own little thing. I order 10 copies of the Big Fat Surprise every couple of months, and I give them out to every doctor who says they'll read it. So anyone I'm talking to about diet, any medical person, I say, will you read a book? And they all say yes, because you know it's not cool to say they wouldn't read a book. Yeah. So you tell us your doctors, you know. And um, they all say yes. It's up to you. And um, and I, I give them a, a copy of Big Fat Surprise. I keep uh, keep some in my car, and uh, that's my contribution to uh, to the medical fraternity. Every single doctor who's read it so far has come to me later on and said that's an incredible book. That's changed the way I uh, I live and how I practice. So I'm not saying that that's the only book around. I think that's the best book, but you know, there are other excellent books uh, around as well. So that's my little contribution to my fellow medical professionals. <coughs> Taxation is another, uh, another issue. That's a, we could talk about that for ages. Uh, one country in the world, Mexico, has uh, put in a soda tax that's had a significant result, uh, reduction in, uh, in uh, soda intake. <coughs> 
So, corn, rice. Diet, as we all know, I don't want to pretend that diet uh, is the only part. This is just for my New Zealand friends because uh, this is Australia winning the World Cup cricket earlier in the year. So, <laughs> you're pretty, you're pretty special, you know. I mean, the two people you are, the whole slide, just for you, you know, okay? Uh, and uh, I, I've lost the rugby one for some reason. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and these are my essentials for, for healthy living the six S's, okay? Yes, sugar, you've got to avoid sedentary behaviour. No smoking, no stress, good sleep, good sun. They're, uh, they're the keys to it all. I worry about uh, you know my profession and uh, where they're going, but uh, uh, I'll close with a, with a lovely quote by, uh, by an American, uh, by a chap by the name of Wendell Berry. Whoops, that's not American. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to health. Thank you very much.